All right, so we're going to go ahead and do an introduction as um, Yes, we do. We do know that we are heard and seen just just <laughs> but yeah, we just figured we were not talking about anything that was top secret just how we're going to run this room today. Um, but um, officially we will start now. Um, and um, Yes, so welcome again. Um, I will go ahead and do an introduction as people continue to come into the room. Um, but thank you all so much for being here today, 6.30 uh, Eastern Standard Time um, with Dr. Hester Baer and I um, for our discussion of episodes three and four um, of Babylon Berlin, uh, this little series that we've decided to call Watch Clutch. Um, and uh, we were so happy that all of, um, that many of you at least, uh, who are currently in this conversation, um, in this uh, webinar, um, that, they, that, that you uh, enjoyed uh, what we did on April 30th for our episodes one and two. We were really, really happy with the feedback. Um, and we decided that um, based on that feedback that we would continue with season one. So we are doing uh, today episodes three and four, um, May 21st, which is next Thursday, episodes five and six, and then May 28th, uh, episodes seven and eight. Uh, so um, if you're enjoying how this is going, uh, we really would love it if you continued um, to join us. Um, and just because I know that um, many of our friends in good institutes around um, North America and indeed the world, uh, maybe even, um, have um, sort of taken up um, advertising with us um, as we've all sort of um, taken on advertising each other's virtual events in this time period. Um, uh, we are happy that uh, we might be having quite a few people from places that are outside of the Washington DC area, which is where Hester and I are based. Uh, my name is Raleigh Joyner. I'm the program coordinator at the Goethe Institute in Washington. Um, and uh, our presenter today is Dr. Hester Baer, who is a, um, a professor of uh, Germanic studies um, and film studies, and also does some dabbling in comparative lit and uh, women's studies over at the University of Maryland College Park. Um, and she is a very knowledgeable person when it comes to this period and um, has taught courses that involve Babylon Berlin as required viewing. Um, and so I think that with her, you all are in very great hands. Um, and so, yes, we are going to go ahead and continue with that um, dialogue today, um, exploring the next two installments of season one. Um, and just as a reminder of um, how our Zoom webinar is set up. So at the beginning, uh, Dr. Bear will go ahead and give her presentation. Um, and then at the end, we open it up to uh, the Q&A. And currently for this, at least webinar, the chat function is turned off so that we can streamline all comments to the Q&A. Um, and I will repeat sort of the way the Q&A and the hand raise function can be used. Um, feel free to submit questions and comments to the Q&A for um, Hester and sometimes me to respond to um, when we open it up to conversation. And if you would like to uh, say something out loud to be unmuted and actually speak into your microphone, uh, you can use the hand raise function so that you can speak into your microphone and um, actually say what you have to say. Um, and for those of you who may not be so familiar with Zoom uh, or maybe new to just in general this kind of platform for event, uh, event, what am I saying, presenting, um, Q&A um, is at the bottom. Uh, so you'll see at the bottom of your screen there's a little thing with two question uh, bubbles. Um, and that's where you can click to submit a question or a comment that you have. Um, and if you would like to raise your hand um, on the sidebar, um, I wish I, well, I'm, I'm on the host side, but um, there is an option where you have a little hand and you can click that if you would like to speak. Um, so those are the main two ways that uh, we encourage you to participate, um, which you can do to the extent that you would like. And we hope that you do. Um, and we look forward to um, everything that you all have to say about not only three and four, but certainly how three and four have sort of bounced off of episodes one and two, and maybe how the season will continue, because we just don't know. None of us have seen the rest of the season yet. So um, yeah, um, and having said that, just a, another, just a couple of uh, 
quick sentences on, um, uh, no, actually I already introduced you. But yeah, so, so thanks so much for you all to be here. And also thanks so much for Dr. Bear uh, to be here again uh, to lead this conversation. And so I will go ahead and turn um, the presentation and the screen over to you and I will mute myself. So take it away. Okay. Okay, well, welcome everyone and thank you for being here. I'm coming to you from my house in Silver Spring, Maryland. And just to reiterate what Raleigh said, I can't see any of you, but I know that there are some familiar faces out there. Um, so greetings to all of you who were here for the previous discussion, which by the way, I think can be viewed on YouTube if you missed it and want to catch up. Um, uh, welcome to those who are here for the first time and also a shout out to some friends and family I know are in the audience tonight. Um, I'm really thrilled that this series is finding such resonance um, and that we can do something to uh, have a fun discussion during this period of quarantine. Um, I also have heard from a lot of you um, after the last event and um, it was really great to hear your thoughts. And I know out in the audience tonight there are some really esteemed scholars and historians of Weimar culture um, who know more about this period than I do. So I really hope that you all will chime in during the discussion period. I'm really looking forward to your comments. Um, and again, you should be able to scroll to the bottom of the screen and click on the Q&A function in order to type in your comments or uh, try to raise your hand. Um, sometimes that leads to some technical difficulties, but I think it's worth trying again um, so that you can unmute your mic um, and, and speak um, so everyone can hear you. So tonight I'll be offering some background information about episodes three and four of Babylon Berlin. And we're gonna look together at a clip from episode four um, and some images that I've collected from the show. Um, after that, we'll open up the conversation. Um, and over the next two weeks, we're going to be, um, as Raleigh said, talking about the remainder of season one of the show. So next week, episodes five and six, and the following week, episodes seven and eight. Um, so tonight, I'm going to try to mostly avoid spoilers about future episodes or where the series is heading next, um, including during the Q&A. And I just want to thank Raleigh Joyner of the Goethe Institute in Washington, DC, for all his work in organizing the series and for doing such a fantastic job of moderating um, the discussion, uh, as I mentioned last time, when Raleigh approached me about doing um, a conversation around the, the series Babylon Berlin, I readily agreed because I'm a really big fan of the series. Um, and I'm expressing my fandom again tonight by wearing a Weimar inspired costume, which does double duty in covering up my quarantine hair. Um, so Last time I began by talking about what I find most intriguing about Babylon Berlin as a series, and that is really its approach to presenting uh, the history and culture of the Weimar era, which deliberately takes some liberties with historical events in order to emphasize the resonances between Weimar and today. And I want to start here again. Uh, I think the creators of the show really succeed in representing the promises and the perils of Weimar without unduly romanticizing the era. Um, by refusing to fetishize authenticity, they open up ways of thinking about unrealized futures and about what might have transpired differently if Weimar, um, if the Weimar developments had not been foreclosed upon by the rise of Nazism. Um, at the same time, I think the show really doesn't hold back on how messy the Weimar period is. Um, and this bears repeating again in reference to episodes three and four, which are based on actual historical events that took place in May 1929 in Berlin, but which again, I think use these events as a jumping off point for highlighting the social, economic and political precariousness and uncertainty of the times rather than aiming to capture them in fully accurate detail. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about uh, how that precariousness and uncertainty unfolds also um, through the formal language, audiovisual language of the show. Um, but I wanna start today with history because during the last uh, discussion that we had, a number of questions came up about the his historical framing of Babylon Berlin, and especially about the role of the political left in the 1920s. Um, and since the episodes that we're uh, talking about tonight delve further into that history, I'd like to begin 
with this presentation with a brief look back at some of the intriguing events um, that took place right at the origin of the Weimar Republic um, before we turn to the way the show itself builds on that, that historical um, imaginary. So the origins of the Weimar Republic really lie in this contested struggle over political power in the wake of Germany's loss of World War I. Essentially, this was a three-way struggle among the revolutionary left, the social democrats, and the country's military and economic elite. Um, and this history begins with the recognition of Germany's generals that the country's war efforts were no longer viable, uh, leading to the beginning of armistice negotiations and the formation of a new German government in October 1918 under Prince Max von Baden. And subsequently, um, soldiers in the city, the northern German city of Kiel, mutinied. They recognized the, the futility of their mission in a war that had already been lost. Um, and this mutiny kind of dominoed into a series of uprisings across the country. Um, and subsequently, the founding of workers and soldiers councils, um, and then the events of the November Revolution of 1918. Um, on the historic date of November 9th, 1918, that very resonant date in German history of November 9th, the same day that the uh, Berlin Wall also fell in 1989, Prince Max announced the abdication of Kaiser Wilhelm II, opening the pathway toward a new political organization of the country. Um, and if you'll just uh, bear with me for a moment, I am going to uh, open up some slides to give you some images of this period of history. Um, here we go. Okay. Raleigh, can you see the slides? Is that working? Yes, I see them. Okay, thank you. Just making sure it's working. Okay, so. Um, here we see, and I wanted to call your attention, there was a lot of interest last time in this historical period. Um, the German Historical Institute, located also in Washington, D.C., has a wonderful website that documents German history in, in images and in authentic historical documents. And I've drawn a lot of the photos that I'm going to show here tonight from their website. Um, so I can definitely encourage you to Google that and, and look for it. It's called German History and Documents and Images, or GHDI, through the uh, German Historical Institute in Washington, DC. Um, and that website um, includes the documentation of many periods of German history, but the, the um, the Weimar era focus is a very, very well curated um, set of images and documents. So here you see um, the, uh, an image of the revolutionary sail sail sailors and soldiers driving through the Brandenburg Gate in Berlin on November 9th, 1918. And I think some of these images will really resonate with um, uh, the visual language of the, of the show Babylon Berlin as well. Um, so when uh, Kaiser Wilhelm abdicated. Um, this led, um, as I mentioned, um, open, opened up a pathway towards a new political organization of the country. Um, and so on this day, November 9th, um, I wrote 1989 on the slide, sorry, <laughs> 1918, um, Karl Liebknecht, the socialist leader, uh, proclaimed a socialist republic in Berlin, and Liebknecht, some, there were some questions about him last time, um, subsequently co-founded the Communist Party of Germany, which plays a role in, um, in the episodes that we're discussing tonight. Um, at the same time, on the same day, um, the Social Democrat, Philipp Scheidemann, also proclaimed a new government, um, the German Republic, that would eventually become the Weimar Republic, um, also in Berlin on November 9th, 19, 1918. And you can see this image of Scheidemann standing in the window with this huge crowd of people below him. Um, uh, so here with uh, Liebknecht and Scheidemann, we see already at the very origins of the Weimar Republic, this split between the revolutionary left and the social democrats. Um, some people last time were also asking about 
Rosa Luxemburg, who was the Marxist thinker and revolutionary who co-founded the Spartacus League with Karl Liebknecht and Claude Setkin during World War I. Um, Rosa Luxemburg uh, and her compatriots were pacifists and they founded the Spartacus League initially um, to protest the so-called Borgfrieden, which was the alignment of the Social Democrats with the imperial state, um, their accommodation to not uh, protest against war efforts. Um, so uh, to protest this accommodation of the left-leaning social democrats with the mainstream supporting World War I, uh, the Spartacus League was founded, um, and later on Luxembourg and again also Liebknecht um, were founding members of the German Communist Party. Um, and here you see clashes that took place in Berlin in the streets during the Spartacist uprising of January 1919 after Liebknecht's attempts to uh, call out a socialist republic in uh, November of 1918 had failed, the Spartacists continue, continued to uh, pursue the revolutionary cause. Um, and uh, in, in January of 1919, this uh, pursuit led to protracted battles in the streets of Berlin. Um, and ultimately, in the course of this uprising, both Liebknecht and Luxembourg were murdered by right-wing paramilitary soldiers, although their deaths were not really uh, um, clarified until much later. Uh, this is an image of Liebknecht, Liebknecht's funeral, um, and uh, there was an empty coffin for Rosa Luxemburg's body at the funeral because it was not found until much later. It was found floating in the Landwehr Canal in Berlin, um, and uh, you might see some resonances in the many images uh, in the course of Babylon Berlin of corpses floating in bodies of water around the city, um, perhaps references also to this history. Um, and in this context, I wanted to also mention uh, the Marxist feminist thinker and women's suffrage activist Clara Setkin, who was the co-founder of the Spartacus League during uh, World War I with uh, Luxembourg and Liebknecht. Um, and Setkin represented the Communist Party of Germany in the Reichstag during the Weimar Republic. She um, was, was not murdered together with her compadres um, and instead um, she was actually elected to serve um, in, in the parliament. Um, but in 1933, then she was forced into exile in the Soviet Union where she died. Um, and I, I mentioned Clark Zetkin because I think um, that she uh, is kind of a model for some of the characters in the show, most especially perhaps Dr. Floker, whom, uh, the communist doctor whom we first encounter in uh, tonight's two episodes. Um, and also because uh, Tsetkin, I think, is an interesting um, historical figure. She had been agitating for women's suffrage since the turn of the 20th century. Um, and women's suffrage, in fact, was codified in 1918, um, one of the early acts of the Republic. And here you see um, the National Assembly uh, that took place in Weimar in February of 1919. This is an image of Friedrich Ebert. Um, who uh, was the people's deputy and later became the, the chancellor, who is holding an opening speech. And this was the assembly taking place in the city of Weimar, after which the Weimar Republic is named. Um, and uh, the constitution of uh, the Weimar Republic was ratified then subsequently in 19, uh, summer of 1919, I think in August, after the signing of the Versailles Treaty. Um, and uh, I mentioned Setkin also in connection with the parliament or the, the um, sorry, National Assembly in Weimar um, because uh, the constitution of the Weimar Republic enshrined women's rights, um, many women's rights, including in addition to suffrage, also equal pay for women, equality of education, and uh, certain professional equalities, for instance, in the appointment of civil servants. Um, though, and, and I think these are topics that are really taken up in the show um, in interesting ways, though as we can see, especially in the depiction of Lotte, um, these rights were very unequally distributed across the classes um, during the Weimar period. Okay, so 
that was just a little flashback um, to the beginnings of the Weimar Republic and to some of the background um, uh, that shapes the, the vi visual language of the show and also the hist hist historical uh, depictions in the show. Um, and now we flash forward 10 years um, where we see the divisions that really underpin the founding of the Republic um, shaping the political scene still. Um, and May Day 1929 in Berlin, uh, which you see an image of here, um, is a historical event that is significant for um, these developments. And I just wanted to say a few words about these um, actual historical events before we turn to how they are depicted in Babylon Berlin. So in April of 1929, the police president of Berlin, uh, Karl Friedrich Zurgiebel, who is a character actually in the show, and we're going to look at him in a minute, he refused to lift a ban on public protests that had been implemented the previous December, ostensibly to protect the public safety. Um, and he, he refused to lift this ban in advance of May Day, which was a traditional um, day for workers protests, um, the Labor Day at the time, um, and continues to be um, the day for, for workers' rights marches um, in Europe and, and other places in the world. Um, so in response to this ban, uh, the Communist Party called for a peaceful mass demonstration in Berlin on, eight, on May 1st, 1929. Um, and thousands showed up in the streets. And um, as we see depicted in the show, the police deployed 13,000 forces who cracked down, in many cases, quite violently on protesters and on uh, civilian bystanders. Um, street barricades were erected in many parts of Berlin, and a state of emergency was called out in the two uh, traditionally working class districts of Wedding, where Lata lives in the show, and of Neukölln, where the protest, the May Day protest that we see, um, and we're going to look at that in a clip in a minute, where, the, where those uh, events take place. These clashes um, of the so-called Bloody May, or sometimes the Zurgiebel May Day of 1929, they lasted for about three days, with 30 protesters being murdered by the police, um, and uh, 200 injuries, and about 1,200 arrests. Um, and uh, this event is historically significant, as we learn, um, because it really exacerbated extant conflicts between the communists and the social democrats, um, preventing them from ultimately uniting in forces in order to combat the rise of Nazism. Um, so that's my little uh, quick and dirty overview of some of the historical events that are um, shaping the depiction of the show. And here we see um, specifically the image of uh, May Day of 1929, as it is shown in Babylon, Berlin. Now, Sarah Giebel, uh, who is played in the show by Thomas Tima, the, the actor, um, was familiar to me mainly <laughs> previously um, through uh, his presence in John Hartfield's collage uh, called, um, let's see, I think I have it here, Self-Portrait with the Police Commissioner Zurgiebel from 1929, um, which is an early uh, political collage of John Hartfield, a German artist, um, that was made really deliberately in response to the events of May 1929. Um, and I think it's such a great image with its kind of overt depiction of the artist poised to cut, the artist himself uh, poised to cut off Sir Giebel's head. Um, and at the same time, it's kind of discursive reflection on collage as a political weapon. Um, and I think in a way, collage might be an apt metaphor for the way that Babylon Berlin itself puts together different uh, signifiers of past and present, the way it just juxtaposes certain kinds of images, um, albeit in the glossy and rather defanged language of uh, global prestige television today. Um, but I think it's interesting to think about how we might understand some of what the show is doing as a, as a form of collage, so maybe that's something that we could come back to later. So I'd like to turn now to the specific depiction of the events of May Day 1929 in 
Babylon Berlin with a clip from the beginning of episode four. Um, and here we see Gerian Rat in this sequence that I'm going to show rather unwittingly being swept into the mass of strikers just as the conflict between the workers and police begins to escalate. Um, and I'd like to draw your attention to a couple aspects of the scene before I show it so that you can pay attention to them uh, while you're watching. So first you'll notice, um, and I have the still here, that the clip begins with an iris shot zooming in on Gary and Rat's eye. Uh, this is a kind of symbolic shot, the iris shot that's very familiar from Weimar cinema and that notably draws attention to one of the show's themes that I talked about a little bit last time, um, and that is the questions that Babylon Berlin raises regarding the truth value of images, pleasure in looking and, and also the ways that visual representation can be implicated in violence in, in various ways. Um, but this Irish shot of Rat that we see here is also an incitement to the viewer of Babylon Berlin to reflect on the process of looking and viewing um, themselves, especially in the sequence that immediately follows, um, which is, is very interesting in its construction. So the setting of the scene is important as it positions viewers in a familiar cityscape. And especially for those viewers who know contemporary Berlin, it ca calls our attention to landmarks such as the subway station at Hermannplatz and the Karstadt department store, which is under construction here, um, as well as at the end of the sequence, the reference to the Kreuzberg neighborhood of SO36. Um, so the setting, first of all, is interesting. Uh, while we're beginning to learn more about Rat as a character over these um, third and fourth episodes, he's still something of an enigma to us, and we don't really know where his political alliances lie. And this scene, I think, really relies on the viewer's uncertainty regarding the character of Rat, um, but also at the same time on the charisma and attractiveness of the actor who plays him, Volker Bruch, um, something that the show comments on directly a couple scenes later when the dying woman tells Rat, oh, you're so handsome. Um, and these qualities of Rat kind of compel us to identify with him as he's pulled into the fray um, by protesting by a protesting worker, and then as he attempts to break free of the mass of protesters and the impending clash in order to find his way to the detective squad. Excuse me. What I find most striking about the sequence, though, and what I hope you can see when, when I show it in a moment, is the cinematography, um, which not only immerses us into the conflict, but also really underscores the broader uncertainty um, of the situation and of the, the broader political situation that it's a, a symptom of. Um, the cinematography underscores this uncertainty by repeatedly violating the 180 degree rule of cinematography. And this is the continuity rule that dictates that two protagonists or two sides counterpoints should always be portrayed in the same left right relationship with one another um, in order to preserve the viewer's sense of spatial orientation in the shot. Um, and this sequence violates that principle over and over again. Um, so I want to show the clip now, and that's just going to mean clicking out of the one. Okay, so we can really see in this sequence how um, uh, oftentimes the police are on one side and then the 180 degree rule is violated so that the police show up in the next, after the next cut on the other side of the screen and it flips and it flips and it also turns on the camera on its axis or the setting on its axis. So um, the scene was clearly shot with multiple uh, cameras in order to provide this coverage, but in the editing, they were constantly flipping things back and forth, um, which gives uh, this very violent impression, this very uneasy impression of the situation, since we can't orient ourselves within the scene, mirroring the way that Pratt himself is uh, also having difficulty uh, orienting himself within this violent conflict. And I think it's a very interesting and not unusual for the show example um, of how the show traces figures the precariousness of the of the time and the difficulty of orienting oneself um, that was so characteristic i think of this period of german history um, so 
until now, I've been talking mainly about the depiction of historical events, um, the, the events of May Day 1929 uh, in Babylon, Berlin, but I'd like to change course a little bit in the last part of my remarks, um, and I'll, I'll be wrapping them up in a minute, and then we'll open up the conversation to your comments and questions. Um, as I have suggested uh, earlier tonight and during the last discussion, the show evokes the history of Weimar, but it does not really strive for a great deal of historical authenticity. And, and as the set designer talked about uh, Uli Hanich, uh, it's, it really sought to, in fact, actively avoid uh, participating in a kind of museumification or museal gaze at the Weimar period. Um, the show uh, evokes the history of Weimar, but it does not uh, strive for this historical authenticity. Instead, I think what it does is kind of collage together or remix as the best pop culture often does, both period signifiers and more contemporary elements in order to address the concerns of the present, um, including, for example, massive income inequality, workers' rights, police brutality and violence against women, subjects that the show treats quite seriously and that obviously are, are of persistent relevance in the present. Um, so I hope that in addition to its approach to history, we might discuss more tonight about your response to the show as a narrative, um, that is its presentation of characters, its use of sound, what makes it compelling and binge-worthy for uh, such a broad range of viewers around the world, and also how it engages with familiar genres, um, to mention just some of the topics that I raised in the viewing questions that were circulated ahead of tonight's event. Um, and I wanna just offer a couple thoughts, just touch on a couple of these topics, um, maybe as a prompt towards the discussion. So episodes three and four focus quite a bit on developing the show's characters, offering us some insight into the backstories of Rat, Lotte, and Volter in particular. We learn some important details that will figure prominently into the subsequent plot of Babylon Berlin over the next two seasons. And I'm not giving any spoilers here, but I'm uh, just offering you, your, you to pay attention, suggesting that you pay attention to some of these particular points. Uh, so Rat's landlady, Elisabeth Benka, herself a war widow, prompts him to open up a little bit about his experiences in World War I. And we learn that Rat's mother could not forgive him for surviving the war. He says, for her, the wrong son returned home. Rat's tortured relationship with his brother, who apparently died on the battlefield and whose body was never recovered, will form a major plot point of the show moving forward. In episode three, we also hear Rat's voiceover of the letter that he reads to Helga, uh, who is his sometime, Rat, Gary and Rat's own sometime lover, and also the wife of his uh, brother, dead brother, and the mother of his nephew, Moritz. Um, when Lotta's mother is treated for syphilis, we learn that she had an affair around the time she became pregnant with Lotta raising the suggestion that Lotta and her siblings might have different fathers. Episode three specifically calls attention to the devastating consequences of women's lack of access to adequate medical care and birth control, um, which is an abiding concern of the show. In a later season, the show also brings in a storyline about abortion, uh, which was a significant topic of debate in the Weimar period. Here we learn that Lotta's older sister, Ilse, has been condemned to an unhappy marriage with the violent Erich because she got pregnant by accident. As for Lotta, she remains the main breadwinner for her family, but to keep her younger sister, Toni, in school, Lotta performs sex work at night in addition to pursuing police work during the day. Uh, the detective, Bruno Volter, the uh, head of the vice division of the, of the police force, discovers Lotta's secret job as a sex worker at Mocha FD. In addition to paying her for sex himself, he also blackmails her into spying on Gary and Rat for him, thus doubly compromising Lotta's chances of succeeding at her ambition to become a detective herself, since it is Gary who has recognized her talent for sleuthing. In episode three, and here, here's the images that you see on the slide, Volter is called to Cafe Justi, which like Mocha Efti and Aschinger was an actual venue in Weimar Berlin, uh, to meet with General Zegers, uh, you see him there with the white beard on the right hand side, and other members of the military elite. 
an encounter that exposes his secret political alliances with forces outside of the social democratic police. And we also learn more about Voltaire's home life in the course of these episodes, and we find out that his wife is an alcoholic. This scene that you see here in Cafe Justi is important, not only because it gives us some clues about the character of Bruno Voltaire, but also because the policeman, Yenica, with the binoculars, who has in turn been enlisted, enlisted to spy on Voltaire, discovers that Voltaire is involved in a plot to assassinate Gustav Stresemann. And Stresemann, of course, was a real historical figure, uh, an important, very important uh, liberal politician in the Weimar Republic, who in 1923 briefly served as chancellor and who later uh, served as foreign minister of Germany for, I think, six or seven years, um, co-winning a Nobel Peace Prize with the French uh, Aristide Briand uh, for their diplomatic work in promoting reconciliation in Europe in the interwar period. Um, and this uh, assassination against Stresemann plotline is, uh, you know, an example of the liberties that the show takes with history. Um, Yenica is able to learn about the plot against Stresemann by reading lip lips, since, as we learn, both his parents are deaf. Um, and later in the episode, Yenica goes on to kind of translate a radio broadcast of Mahler's lead, Ich bin der Welt abhanden gekommen, uh, uh, translated as I am lost to the world, um, Yenika translates the song coming out of the radio or his parents via sign language. And as I pointed out in the pre-circulated questions, Babylon Berlin is a pretty loud show um, and the music and sound design are very important for the show. Um, but I think this playing with silence that happens, um, especially in episode three, but, but throughout the season is, is also very interesting to think about um, and both sound and silence are important for the formal construction of the show. And I, I'd be interested to hear your comments about where you notice that or, or what you make of it. Uh, Yenica's translation of music for his deaf parents directly follows upon a scene where Lotta goes to the movies to see the silent film mentioned on Sontag, People on Sunday, whose inclusion here um, in the series is a bit of an anachronism because the film actually wasn't shot until the summer of 1929 and was not released in the theaters in Germany until uh, February of 1930. Uh, and so um, it's not possible that uh, Lotta could have seen that movie in May 1929. Um, but again, this is an example of the liberties that the show takes um, and, and it's, it's uh, deliberate use of an anachronism at times. Um, I, I mentioned this film last time, and I'm mentioning it here again because she sees the movie, but also because uh, it will return again as an important intertext of Babylon Berlin next week um, in episode six, um, which we'll be talking about a week from now. Um, and if you're interested in watching the film, um, I, I checked back and I'm pretty sure that it's available to, to stream on the Criterion channel. Um, so uh, it's really worth watching. Um, the way that Babylon Berlin, as I talked about last week and, and talking about again now, um, the way it engages with intermediality, with forms of music and film, uh, both from the time period and subsequently is one of, I think, the strong points of the show. Um, and it's, it's really quite worthwhile to see how it does that by um, looking at some of the, the films that were so important for, um, for its own form and content. Um, um, so uh, I, I encourage you to do that if it, if it interests you. Um, uh, um, people on Sontag, pe people on Sontag, mention on Sontag, People on Sunday, um, is a milestone of Weimar film history, which was made by a collaborative team of filmmakers, uh, writers and directors working together, um, including uh, Billy Wilder, um, Robert Siodmak, Edgar G. Ulmer, and Fred Zinnemann. Uh, all of whom, all four of whom left Germany soon afterward, um, most of them as refugees from Hitler, uh, Siodmak I think left sooner um, than that, all four were European Jews. Um, and while Billy Wilder is obviously the most famous of these filmmakers, all four of them went on to play a really significant role in the development of film noir in the, in the US um, during their careers in Hollywood. Uh, with classic films like these, um, Billy Wilder's Double Indemnity, uh, Robert Siodmak's The Killers, uh, also Fred Cinnamon's Act of Violence and Ulmer's Detour. Um, and uh, these classic films 
kind of reimagined the cinematic language of Weimar Expressionism and also of films from the Neue Sachlichkeit, the New Objectivity, which um, mentioned am Sonntag as an example of, and we'll talk about that more next time. Um, they, they kind of reimagined a lot of the aesthetics of uh, German cinema of the interwar period um, in the context of Hollywood. Uh, and I, I raise this point because Babylon Berlin itself has often been described as a neo-noir, um, and neo-noir I think is e an even more apt description of the Volker Kutcher novels um, from which the show is adapted. Um, and, and I think that there's an interesting way in which the series could be said to perform a kind of reversal of the original trajectory of film noir. Um, that is, they envision German expressionism and the Weimar period sort of backward through the lens of the Hollywood noir aesthetic that German speaking refugees were so instrumental in shaping in the first place. Um, and in this regard, people on, Son on Sunday, which, uh, by the way, again, is not an expressionist film, is so integral maybe to Babylon Berlin because it's kind of a fulcrum for this point of reversal. So I will raise this topic again next week, um, but for now, let's open things up to your comments and questions. Um, I'm going to stop the share screen, um, and I'm really looking forward to hearing your thoughts on um, what I've talked about and just your, your own comments on, um, on what you found most interesting about these two episodes of the show. All right, and thank you so much again, Dr. Bear, for your presentation. Um, and so now we're gonna open it up to conversation with everybody. And um, I'm just gonna reiterate this. I'm sorry if you've heard us or me say this like through email or um, on here, I think, we, we even addressed it before we actually went like went officially live um, before. Um, just we we just want to make sure that um, everybody's on board with the tech. Just you know, in the name of optimizing accessibility with the technology, you know, we don't want to make any ageist or classist sort of assumptions about what people can do with Zoom or uh, everybody's abilities to sort of navigate this platform. So if you've heard us say a couple of times about these things, please bear with us. But uh, yeah, so the Q&A function is at the bottom. So that's where you'll go if you would like to uh, submit a um, question uh, or comment. Um, and if you'd like to raise your hand and actually be unmuted and speak, um, that will be in sidebar for you. Um, well, that's in sidebar for me. I believe that there's a hand that you can click that shows that you would like to speak. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and start with um, an interesting comment that Roberta J has commit, um, uh, submitted um, about how, uh, Hester, you were talking about um, uh, November 9th, 19, uh, uh, now I'm getting my dates messed up, 19, 19 um, uh, and then that being a significant date in German history because of um, this um, uprising, and then also, of course, that being a significant date in 1989 with the fall of the Berlin Wall. She also mentions that Kristallnacht happened on that date, which was, um, for anybody who might not be familiar with Kristallnacht, that was the night of the broken glass in 1938, I want to say, and that was when the Sturmabteilung, um, which was basically the paramilitary force of the Nazi party, the, the brute squad, so to speak, went, um, and one night they set fire to uh, brutalized, vandalized quite a bit of Jewish homes, Jewish owned businesses. Um, so thanks for that too, because that is another very important November 9th in German history. Um, and uh, then we have another um, interesting question and comment from Linda R um, that perhaps could also uh, deal with the sort of intertwining of genre and history. Uh, she said, my friend and I consider this time period to be a violent soap opera. Uh, what do you think about that comment? Uh, because I do see what she means and I was wondering what you might think about that. Yeah, that's great. Thank you very much for the point about Crystal Nutt. I should have mentioned that as well. It's absolutely true. November 9th is this very resonant date in German history um, with the 1918 revolution um, and the, the 1938 um, Kristallnacht and the 1989 fall of the wall. So I think that's very, very important to point out. Thank you very much. Um, regarding the violent soap opera, I think that's great. I, 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 I think that's a really interesting 
way of describing not only this period of uh, German history or the representation of this period in Babylon Berlin, but, but also in a way of, of why serial television in, in the present has become so popular and so important for us, the way that it's able to blend uh, certain elements of like the neo-noir or the detective story in this case with the serial element of soap opera, um, which were really the original serials, right? The original shows that developed characters um, in, in all different directions, <laughs> often, uh, you know, really challenging our um our cre credulity <laughs> about what they were doing right but i but i think that this is a great way of describing what the what the genre blend of um babylon berlin does and and also many other shows right i mentioned last week that uh the writer of the novels Volker kutcher uh kind of base his his novels which are also serialized i think they're up to eight of them by now or something like that based them in part on the sopranos which is the you know one of the or uh examples of violent soap opera i would say so uh i think that's great um and i might have to steal it from me thank you <laughs> so now we have um from Jill S um, has submitted, um, thanks so much, also, first of all, for your nice words at the beginning. Um, and then she goes on to mention um, that in the last presentation, Hester, that you did, you talk about sort of the uneven strategy that the creators of the show take about history, um, and especially how they deliberately don't fetishize history. Um, and she points out that there is this sort of mixture, of course, of the fictional characters and then the real things that are happening in that time period. Um, but she points out one particular thing about the misuse of the anti-prostitution law, uh, which is named in the show as paragraph 361, clause six. And um, for anybody who was watching the, the, that, those episodes, you know that that's what um, Bruno Volta cites when he's trying to um, blackmail Lotta into um, basically giving him information about Gerion and um, basically that prostitutes and sex workers in the city are required to register with the Vice Squad. Um, and she points out that this was actually not even in effect in 1929 anymore. And so she wonders why did you think that this um, was being made part of the plot when it's no longer actually something that was on the law books or being enforced? And why do you think maybe that the creators uh, were misrepresenting the history of sex work in Berlin? Um, and does that imply that maybe they were taking more of a morally conservative, uh, you know, sort of stance on what sex work should or should have been at that time than actually the Weimar government was. Um, and what does that reveal about the series versus about the time period in which it's set? Yeah, that's a uh, great question. Thank you, Jill. Um, Jill Smith, by the way, is the author of Berlin Coquette. And I, uh, I recommend her book highly to anyone who's interested in this period and these topics. It's an excellent book. Um, so I appreciate um, her chiming in here. Um, and I'd be really curious what, what you have to say about this question, Jill. I mean, I think um, this is a good example of the way that the show blurs history and um, and fiction um, in order to make broader statements about the 1920s and the challenges faced by women at the time. Um, and uh, I, for me, I, I don't think that um, it suggests a more conservative uh, moral stance on women's sexuality than the Weimar period. Although I would really have to think through the implications of your question. I think they want to use the question of sexuality as a way of uh, examining how difficult it is for a working class woman to professionalize and how uh, the, um, the question of sex is uh, repeatedly brought into uh, the equation, you know, by all of the men with whom she's working. Um, and I, I think this is one way uh, that they choose to take a shortcut in order to do that. But I, I 
I appreciate your point, and I also recognize that you know a lot more about this topic than I do. So I would I would really be very interested to know um, to, to know more about how you see that. Um, I do think you know as the show develops that the characterization of Lotta becomes um, flatter in a certain way. Um, I really, for me, the first season um, uses the tension between her day, her life during the daytime in the police headquarters um, and her connections to the, the vice squad in particular, um, uses the tensions between that and her uh, attempt to, you know, keep her sister in school and keep her family um, fed more or less uh, through sex work uses that tension in a way that I think really works to, to make for a complex depiction of, of, um, of the difficulties that women faced um, at the time. Um, but I, but I, I'll think more and take your point and think more about it for next time. <laughs> also Dan from LA, actually he's a colleague of ours from uh, Goethe, Los Angeles. So thanks so much Dan for tuning in. Um, he pointed out, um, just to clarify, that the issue um, about Lota is that she is not registered with the police as a sex worker, which is one of the stipulations of paragraph 361. And that made me actually wonder, um, because this is something that was a thing during uh, this part of history in Germany and in many other European countries and in the US, where if you are of some kind of group, you know, you have to register as that, you know, whether it's of what your religious affiliation, and it's still that way with religious affiliation in Germany, um, and with many other things, of course, if you are homosexual, you have to register, it, it, or you can be registered because they can, you know, figure out who's subscribing to what magazines or whatever. Um, do you have anything sort of to say about the culture of, of that keeping tabs on who's doing what and everybody having to register or not every but you know what I mean like people having to register as this and the police and the authorities and bureaucracy sort of having this keeping tabs on everybody and of course as we know as it transitioned into the Third Reich these registrations ended up uh, being used against people um, for many reasons but during the Weimar Republic um, what do you think was the purpose of that? Like, what do you think it, yeah, was supposed to accomplish? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, of, of course, you know, with sex work, for instance, there's often, you know, a, a legislative argument that, you know, is, for some is patronizing and for others is a way of, you know, establishing uh, oversight that, that can help people. Um, so I think it's a complicated question. As we know, you know, Germany still mandates police registration um, for for people um, for you know establishing residency and all the, all of these other things. So um, you know, it's a question of of demographics sometimes, and um, uh, but certainly as you yourself said, and as I was going to say, I mean, it was it was really sorry, I didn't want to steal your thunder. <laughs> misused in the Weimar period, obviously, this type of, of legislative mandate, and it was misused, um, obviously, by the Nazis afterwards, and it continued to be misused in the, in the post-war period as well, uh, to persecute all kinds of minority populations, and so, um, yeah, I think, I think you kind of answered your own question there with that one. <laughs> came back around. Um, so Jill also poses an interesting question on the topic of sort of um, sex work and sexuality in this show. Um, she talks about um, how in the previous presentation uh, you lingered on that scene where uh, Lotta and Gerion run into each other as they're in police headquarters and they drop the photos and they're sort of having that odd sort of exchange where it's like, oh, I think this is yours, I think this is yours, and they're these two different kinds of pictures. One is with the pornography that they've confiscated and the other is Lotta's pictures that she's archiving of the very mutilated bodies. Um, and so um, she asks, uh, you know, thinking about also the sequence at the end um, of season, uh, sorry, of episode two with the Mocha FD performance and how that sort of cross cut these sort of erotic images of um, the performance with the very violent images of the Trotskyites being slaughtered by the um, Russian hitman. Um, and also then at the beginning of episode four where you have the Marlene Dietrich song and the floating corpse um, uh, 
is there anything that you might be able to say about sort of this sort of intertwining of sex and violence um, and how that continues to pop up throughout the series? Yeah, I think it's a great question. I mean, I, I, I think there's a couple of things right, right off the bat that I would say about that. I mean, as I have been emphasizing, the show is really a lot about, um, you know, what is termed in, in psychoanalytic language, scopophilia, this kind of pleasure in looking, and it's really probing how that kind of pleasure in looking um, works through sex and erotic images and also through violence um, and um, this verging that you're you're mentioning Raleigh between sort of a, a form of pornography and violence and, and sexuality is I think a, an abiding premise of the show's entire construction um, but also one that I think seeks to you know illustrate something about the the sort of idea of the dance on the volcano um, that we think of in, in thinking about the Weimar period itself, this period where there were extremes, um, a lot of extremes, and, and that was both emancipating in certain ways and, um, and also really precarious and oppressive in other ways. Um, and that, you know, kind of tension between those two sides, I think is really important. And, um, you know, if anyone watches uh, People on Sunday, or for those of you who are already familiar with that film, I think there's something so interesting about um, that film being so important for season one of the show, because you find this same thing in that show. Um, the, the, the film is in one way about these friends going to the lake on Sunday for their leisure time and very, very light and, you know, very, very sweet and beautiful film, but there's this really kind of horrifying uh, sexual violence that underlies the, the story as well. Um, and so I, I think that's another place where um, you, you get this tension um, going on. Uh, and I mean, there, there are tons of examples um, that we can talk about with the way the editing, as you point out, um, cross cuts um, um, between um, uh, pornographic images and mutilated um, violent bodies um, in in one way or another. So I think it's a great point. Yeah. And also, um, just on uh, the point about registration and sort of, um, you know, watching people and what they do and how they move. Um, just uh, one of our uh, participants has made the interesting comment that, you know, registration affects everybody too in this time period and that you know if we lie on a form you know um with Goethe I mean I'm, I, I can't say for sure if that's actually the case if it was true but I mean if something that's funded by the German government um you know like every everything like there's nothing on the on, on a form or on the internet that's going away these days you know um and you know this idea of Überwachung and you know people putting tape over their web webcam now and this idea that yeah we're continuing to be watched and you know we're continuing to have tabs kept on us uh, with Facebook you know at least people when they say that they're <laughs> they're having a conversation about shoes uh, with their phones sitting near them and the next thing they know they're on Facebook and there's a bunch of ads for shoes and they're like you know so yes certainly not just uh, not just in the Weimar Republic I would agree but um, the of registration. What yeah. the present is all about, especially the present during the pandemic, when uh, so much of you know, as if our lives weren't already on a digital platform completely, now they are a hundred percent on a digital platform, as evidenced by what we're doing here right now. So, yes, absolutely, this this is a, a very salient point. Yeah, um, and so you also mention. Um, in your presentation about sort of the, of course, the murders of uh, Luxembourg and Liebknecht and sort of the role of the Spree um, and as part of the landscape of Berlin and how at least Rosa Luxemburg's, to my memory, was her body was thrown into the river uh, or at least one of the canals branching off of the river. Um, so Amanda S. has asked uh, the question, you know, um, in the viewing questions that you sent out, you quoted the song text about Berlin laughing and crying. Um, and she says that in watching these two episodes, she was struck by how similarly that they start. So at uh, the beginning of episode three, um, it's almost kind of comical because you see um, the character who has survived in the latrine earlier coming out uh, naked um, and uh, you know running out of the spray. 
Um, but then at the, at the beginning of episode four, there's this really horrifying shot of Boris, uh, the dead body, floating in the river. And so she asks, what role do you think that these sort of juxtapositions play in the larger narrative structure and in reading the city of Berlin's role in the series? That's a great, great question. I love, I love how you pointed out that parallel. And I agree. I mean, um, the show in the way that it verges or, you know, sort of drastically veers between um, sort of sex, you know, light and erotic things and then extreme violence, as we just discussed, um, it also really does veer between sort of the comic um, and the tra tragic in, um, in, in regular swerves. Um, and I think this is a good example. There's a deliberate parallelism here, it seems to me, in the openings of these two episodes, the one where um, Kardikov jumps off of the, of the bridge onto the coal, um, uh, onto the barge that's transporting coal because he's trying to escape. He's naked and covered in crap, literally, and the, trying to escape the, the cops who are, are running him down for indecent exposure. Um, uh, and it is a really funny scene, um, but it's, it's also showing the reflection of Berlin in the river there or in the canal, I'm not sure. Um, and at the start, I showed the image also in my, in my slides of the starting um, uh, uh, of, the, of the episode four, where we see that beautiful image of Berlin reflected of the, like the museum's insel um, reflected in, um, in the water. Uh, and then the corpse floats up. Um, so, I, I mean, I think you make a great point just within the question itself that there's not a whole bunch that I can add to it, but I, I think that deliberate parallelism is there um, and, and is really quite specifically showing us this kind of comic and tragic um, of Berlin and, and of the era. And, and it's, it's quite similar in the way that it highlights the, the dance on the volcano, the highs and lows of the time, um, and, and maybe calls our attention to, to the parallels um, in the present day in that regard as well. Yeah, and also that made me think of just on that, the, um, the role of nudity itself in the show so far. I mean, you see, when do you see nudity? You see it, um, you know, partial nudity in sort of the erotic sense when uh, the, the dancers are portrayed in the club, you see it in various depictions of sex or sex work. Um, but then of course, when do you also see it? You see it in death. And then in this odd way, um, the character, I keep forgetting his name. Uh, it's uh, the Trotsky character who escapes death. It's almost like he's being reborn literally out of the spray at the beginning because he's naked and he's run and he's, he survived this slaughter. Um, but then, of course, you also see depictions of nudity uh, on the autopsy table, like with Boris being um, examined. Um, so yeah, this sort of juxtaposition between nudity as something that is erotic, and then nudity as something that's a little more sinister representation of violence and death, um, which sort of speaks to the parallels that we were talking about earlier. Um, oh yes, Kardikov, thank you for somebody who, uh, who mentioned that. Um, so um, on that, uh, about Kardikov and sort of his betrayal, um, uh, Linda has asked the question um, in these two episodes that we start to see the theme of betrayal, um, including, of course, uh, Svetlana Slorkina. Um, and already here, and then certainly later episodes, she says, it seems like every character either betrays another um, or is betrayed or both. Um, so do you have anything to say about the theme of betrayal in the show so far? Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I didn't really get around to talking too much about uh, Zorokina in Zorokina in my presentation tonight, and I was sorry about that because I think she's a very intriguing character and, and a really important one, obviously, in these episodes as well. Um, and so I'm glad that you you raised her. Um, and yes, she she um, is uh, initiating this theme of betrayal that um, really continues throughout all three seasons of the show. And I, I think a big part of this um, regards what I talked about last time. I don't know if you were here for that discussion, but um, the, the showrunners of the film, Tom Tickfer, um, Achim von Boreas, and, and Henk Henlichten, um, they talked about how it was really their uh, deliberate intention with the show to think through the fact that within a couple of years of 1929, 
all of the characters that we see here would essentially be having to accommodate themselves with Nazism willingly or less so. Um, and I think the issue of betrayal and how it pertains to sort of opportunism or um, uh, the, the different kinds of political alliances that people made in order to uh, either get ahead or, or survive or, um, you know, quite specifically um, to enact violence in this period. Um, are really implicated and bound up in the theme of betrayal always. And so uh, I think it's great, great of you to call attention to that theme. Yeah. And also somebody, um, like another guest has made an interesting point about Soarkina, about her role as a performer, a singer. Uh, not only does she perform as psycho Nikos, you know, uh, in drag, so to speak, but she also is the theremin player in the orchestra during the daytime. I think, right? And, um, and so as a performer, not only in the literal sense, um, but somebody who is performing various um, aspects of gender, um, it is sort of uh, interesting to see that she's performing also uh, loyalties, as this person points out, someone with mixed loyalties, so that she's, she's performing, uh, you know, allegiances with different groups of people. You can't really pin her down in many ways. Um, so yeah, I think that's a very astute observation about that character. And just to state the obvious maybe, um, but uh, her her sort of performance name or drag king name is Nikoros, which is Sorokina spelled backwards, right? And, um, and so right there, there's this kind of reversal that the character is always enacting in these performances um, uh, written into the name as well. Yeah. So um, we do have one question um, from another attendee who said, um, what do you think about the blending? Uh, so this kind of goes back to what Jill mentioned about sort of bringing back in um, this uh, clause about sex work um, that was obsolete at the time, but was brought back into the show. Um, so what do you think about sort of the blending and manipulation of um, historical reality with fiction, given that not everybody is as curious as we and as um, our our guests are about what actually happened and they might take it at, at face value. And um, what do you think might be the implications of that? What are the responsibilities of the creators of a show like this to accurately versus uh, creatively portray the past this way? Yeah, I mean, it's a really important question. It comes up all the time in thinking about the history of German cinema um, and especially contemporary German films, which so, and I mean, not, not only Germany, but because Germany's history in the 20th century was so, um, so varied and so problematic, and many contemporary films depict aspects of this history. Um, and many of them, uh, you know, they take different approaches and, and, and many of them have been criticized roundly and soundly very often for failing to accurately or adequately depict history. And I think, you know, especially when we're talking about certain, certain periods and certain topics, it's very, very important to do that, um, to, to depict history ac accurately and not to be involved in falsifications or misinformations, as you suggest. Um, at the same time, um, no narrative feature film can accurately depict history in a completely authentic way. And so what you find a lot um, are so-called heritage films, which really sort of fetishize or, um, or linger on certain kinds of details in order to make historical periods like the Weimar period or oftentimes in German cinema, also the Nazi period and even uh, the GDR, um, into sort of musealized spectacles for our consumption in, in ways that are sometimes very troubling. For me, this show resists that kind of aesthetic for the most part. Um, and I, I, I have been really clear that I'm approaching it as a fan. I really like the show. And, and I really think that what it does by mixing things up a little bit 
doesn't stray too far from the facts and sometimes in fact enhances um, our ability to apprehend how this period might resonate with the present. But I recognize that for some people, this kind of liberty taking um, doesn't work so well. And, you know, we talked last time, for instance, about the show's uh, really problematic erasure of Jews from the Berlin of the 20s. Um, and I think this is a place where the show really fails in this regard and where if it had been attending a little bit more carefully to history, um, maybe uh, would have uh, addressed that erasure, you know, better. Um, and uh, I think there, there are some other topics that we could talk about that the show does not do a great job in, in representing and some of those maybe will, will come up. For the most part, I appreciate the aesthetic gestures of the show towards um, you know, what the set designer, for example, talked about, as I quoted before, as, as resisting the musealization of this time, or um, the costume designer, um, whose name I, I'm forgetting right now, he's a French uh, costume designer, um, who worked with a huge staff of, of costume designers and makers to create the costuming for the show. Um, he talked about how um, the, all the clothes for the show are timeless. I mean, they were much less concerned with uh, uh, creating costumes that were originally authentic than with um, thinking about, you know, what, it, what is it about the fashion of Berlin in the 1920s that has a lasting, has had a lasting influence and impact that can be seen in the present day. And then they tried to um, emphasize that uh, those the elements in the way that they did the costuming. So, I mean, it's very clear the costuming is not at all authentic. I think these kinds of details, things like costuming and music, um, are much more interesting to uh, fudge on or take liberties with than, you know, for instance, facts about uh, uh, laws or, or populations of people who were important or, or these kinds of things. So I think that you have to be a little careful in distinguishing, but, but it's a very important question that you raise. So thank you. So um, luckily, uh, I'm, at least I'm not surprised to see that quite a few of the folks who are um, tuning in, uh, for them, the sort of eerie similarities between uh, the scene of the of the uprising, um, you know, bet between that and what's happened uh, in recent times and the last, and also of course throughout history, but especially now, um, it's 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 not so different. And um, so several people have posed the question: um, What do you think that um, this period uh, of the Weimar, um, the history of the Weimar Republic and of Germany? reveals not only about um, Germany and um, about the way that the creators decided to represent uh, this period through the show, but also what does it reveal about today? Um, and what do you think that um, there are certain things, of course, that they decided to pull out? Uh, so what do you think um, those decisions reflect? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question and I would love to hear what other people have noticed about the show in this way. I mean, I, I did mention a couple of things that really stand out for me in my presentation that I'll repeat here. Um, one is income inequality, um, a really, really significant topic of the present that, um, that resonates very strongly to what was happening in Weimar and some of the reasons why uh, Germany's first democracy failed to succeed <laughs> is because it was not able to address working workers' rights and working class populations um, adequately while others, uh, the, the seated elite military and aristocracy um, continued to prosper um, in some time in some cases really prospered even more so um, during this period and the show will continue to pursue that especially in over later seasons especially as we move towards the stock market crash of 1929 which figures really strongly in, in season three um, and i think the way the show treats that you might there there are some uh there are some quibbles with it uh, perhaps but um but it it definitely puts it directly into dialogue with um, the financialization of things in the present and, and, and interesting ways in that regard. Um, I think police brutality is a big topic um, of the show that, um, and the corruption of the police forces and the, the role that police play in 
uh, defending unjust laws and in um, propping up certain, uh, you know, government um, uh, groups is really visible in the show. And I think that this is clearly a topic that is um, very resonant to the present, um, continues to be very resonant to the present. Um, and, you know, I think the question of gender equality and um, of, uh, you know, eman emancipation of gender roles and sexuality is, is one that's very important in the 1920s, uh, historically speaking, that the show picks up on, um, and one that's also really, really important in the present time. And I think the, the show runners and writers are very interested in um, how little things have changed in this regard in some ways, even as we continue to think of ourselves as sort of enlightened and emancipated when it comes to gender and sexuality today. Um, and finally, I mean, the, the, the show clearly um, takes place on the brink of the Nazi um, uh, transition in Germany um, and uh, the reasons why uh, authoritarianism and a fascism succeeded are a main uh, premise of the narrative. Um, the, the show is interested in investigating the social, e economic, and political reasons behind um, the failure of the Weimar democracy and the ability of the Nazis to, to come to power in Germany. Um, and I think uh, this is, you know, clearly um, something that they had in mind when they decided to make a show about this period, um, right, you know, around the time of Brexit, the election of Trump, and um, uh, the resurgence of a, a, a Nazi, very, you know, neo-Nazi right wing in, in Germany as well, um, to think about, you know, uh, how how did people, you know, what did people think in 1929 was going to happen? What do people think is going to happen now? <laughs> um, and, and I think they are working through different dimensions of those questions um, by, by sort of trying to, specifically trying to create connections between the 20s and today in the show. Yeah, and it also made me think of, of course, the absolute unnecessary use of brutal violence to put down a piece, you know, a pretty peaceful, as, as that is to say, unarmed uprising um, or protest, which of course is something that continues to happen today. And I just thought if I, could, I would throw in the pot, uh, especially for people who might be interested in the landscape of Berlin um, and sort of the intertwining of the literal physicality of the city and the, um, the events that happen within it, uh, there's, a, there's a part um, when they're beginning to have the May Day demonstration where, um, and if many of you who have been to Berlin might be familiar with this, but the older streets are paved with these cube shaped rocks. And uh, one of the people who was on the side of the protesters, he picks up this rock and those are heavy rocks, <laughs> but um, he throws it. Um, and um, it reminded me of um, in 1990, the um, eviction of Mainzerstrasse, which um, for anybody who might be curious about that, that was after the wall fell, um, people who were squatting um, and occupying old, uh, mostly tenement buildings from uh, Kreuzberg, they started to move into the Eastern section of the city and they were occupying empty tenement buildings in Friedrichshain and there was one street on what was called Mainzerstrasse, I think still was Mainzerstrasse, uh, that they wanted to tear down the buildings and the people who were squatting, the whole squatter community that did not want to um, be evicted and the police came in and I don't think anybody was killed, but people were very uh, badly wounded in, in, in the police's, once again, unnecessary um, uh, violence that they were taking against the people who were just trying to stand their ground and then that also was very, if I recall correctly, marked by the throwing of those square uh, street stones, which really didn't start until the police started to, to be aggressive towards them. But um, yeah, just you see that sort of go through history and I, I did like that they sort of, I don't know if that was their, their intention, but I like that they lingered on that, picking up that, that big old stone, because there's a lot of history in those stones in the streets of Berlin. Well, that's 
the throwing of cobblestones like that was in the French Revolution too. I mean, this yeah. was historically the throw, picking up the street stones and, you know, throwing them is um, a revolutionary gesture, um, you know, with a great deal of resonance. So yes, I'm sure that was deliberate <laughs> to do that in yeah. on that. Side. It's a great thing to notice, yeah. yeah. And it's an interesting right to the city message, right? Because it's like, we're literally using the city that we have to fight back against something that we believe is unjust. At least that's how I perceive it. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, and we have a couple of interesting questions about um, the characterization and the setting in the show. Um, so somebody has asked um, about Mocha FD at the club. Um, they said, uh, it looks like a character itself. Of course, it has its daytime face and it has its nighttime face. Um, and they asked, could you comment at all on how so many different political factions um, met there without conflicting? Or do you think that the director used poetic license? Is it sort of like the Seinfeld diner of <laughs> Babylon Berlin, where it's just, this is where things convene? What do you think? Yeah. I mean, I do think I do think that it was a place where different populations mixed, um, uh, historically speaking. And I don't know a great amount of details about the actual Mocha FD, but it was a nightclub in Weimar, Berlin, and and I think that the that the um, that the director probably uses some poetic license. Like I don't know the extent to which the there was you know a, a prostitution ring in the basement of the Mocha FD or, or things like that. This might be um, this might be a, a, a fictionalized component there, but I do think that um, the nightlife of Weimar Berlin was democratizing um, and that is one of the things that has made this period um, so historically resonant um, to people uh, up until the present day because there um, there were exactly diverse populations mingling together in certain um, clubs and in the same way that Berlin continues now to to or at least in non-quarantine times to um, to offer a nightlife that draws um, that draws people from all over Europe and and the world um, to uh, to party together. And so let's just do a couple more questions. And um, we have a couple questions just about subplots and plots and characters. So I think that would be a nice way to round off the discussion. Um, so Michelle has asked the question. Um, I appreciated the tension between the system. Syst oh, I mess up this word all the time. Systematization or categorization of the homicide photographs that Lotta is involved in, which represents an effort to control information and knowing, uh, versus the subplot, which is driven by the photograph with the scratched out face, and that obfuscated face mo motivates the detective su subplot uh, where Gaelian is trying to find out the truth of this picture, um, and we're not sure why and we're not sure who all of the mysterious figures behind this are yet. So uh, if I understand correctly, there's sort of this, there's these, these, these two uh, plots that are at odds where they're the characters who are striving to know and then there are the characters who are striving to cover up and um, keep things hidden. Um, so do you have any sort of thoughts on how those two plot lines uh, are sort of moving with each other throughout the show? Yeah, and it, I mean, I think it's really important that these are both um, photography, uh, examples of photography, and, and the show uses film and photography um, in very reflective ways um, and raises questions that really started coming up during this time period, um, first um, in, in history, about the to what extent are, are images, photographic or filmic images, um, to what extent do they reveal the truth or can we uh, rely on them to tell us something true and authentic? And um, I think the show plays with this um, in really, really interesting ways um, through exactly the two examples that you raised, the sort of classification and archiving of images, um, which is a way for the police to try to um, create some kind of knowledge base from which to operate. Um, so really relying on this kind of epistemological value of the images. Um, and on the other hand, the difficulty of knowing what's going on with the scratched out face, uh, notably the scratched out face of, of Konrad Adenauer, whose 
put into, and I noticed somebody else said, you know, sadomasochism is a big part of the show. Yes, very, very good. Thank you for using that word and pointing that out. Um, the show puts uh, Conrad Adenauer, who was a Catholic politician, as we talked about a little bit last time, uh, mayor of Cologne, and who later became the first chancellor of post-war West Germany, and this very, you know, important kind of conservative, distinguished father figure for the post-war nation, puts him into like a BDSM <laughs> situation um, and we see this image and with the scratched out head and the difficulty of, of trying to figure out um, what's going on with this image is is the absolutely and what's going on with images in general um, is what drives the plot of the entire show um, and this is a topic that comes up in Weimar cinema as well um, uh, and so a lot of the film of the show's use of intertext to the Weimar period um, is also about kind of playing with this way of using images within images to question the status of images. I um, mean, it also goes back to the question that Jill raised before about about looking and taking pleasure in um, violence, looking at violence um, versus taking pleasure in looking at erotic imagery and the places where those two things converge, especially around um, certain kinds of um, uh, objectification of women in particular, but also people in general through those kinds of images. Yeah, and I was also just off of the sadomasochism comment, and specifically that it was Konrad Adenauer who was depicted in this sort of, uh, how would you say, um, you know, not so not so positive uh, situation. I'm trying to think of the term, but I, um, it's lost on me right now. I'm looking for a word, but I can't find it. Um, but, uh, you know, this idea that people, especially in BDSM situations, that, you know, people like, people who would be in a, power, say, a position of power like him would be the kind of people, or, you know, the, that they, when they seek out, you know, sort of masochism, they are already people who hold a lot of power. And so when they seek out masochistic sort of things, they, they do that because they have this, you know, the, the sort of cycling of power where it's like, okay, like, I can afford to give up this power because I know that when I walk out of the scene, I have it again. And sort of the role of, of role playing, once again, like we were talking about earlier, and performativity, and also image, like public image versus private image, which um, brings me to another question that someone has asked about uh, Bruno Rota. Um, uh, Claire has said, um, I'm having a hard time figuring out where Detective Rota's political allegiance lies, given the tense sense tense scene between him and the uh, female doctor called to see the woman shot in Bloody May. It's clear that he doesn't have communist tendencies and there are some comments he makes to Rat about being a soldier that seems to imply some conservatism, but are there any scenes or bits that I should return to that are cl clear clues to Walter's affiliation or should I just continue watching? Uh, you've put your finger on an important point, <laughs> Claire. Um, yes. Uh, uh, you, you definitely called it. Volter does not sympathize with the communists. Um, and as we learn from the scene uh, that I talked about where um, he goes on a, on a secret meeting at the Cafe Yosti with uh, General Ziegers and some other uh, men, he has some kind, something to do with the military elite um, of Germany and he has, uh, he's being spied on by the character Yenika when he has these meetings because the social democratic police are concerned about his affiliations as well. So I think that um, that scene where he meets with the generals um, is an important scene. Uh, the, what you noted, the scene where he um, clearly uh, is experiences tension with the with the doctor or creates a tense situation with the doctor is uh, is very telling um, and his the question of his political alliances will continue to uh, be something that is probed by the show as we move forward so um, pay attention yes yeah and also it makes me think of yeah just on, on off the previous question about image uh, and impressions and the word I was looking for about Adenauer was compromising. He was in a compromising situation. Compromising. But yeah, like his his image as, as as a leader versus his image literally as it's captured in this picture, this this sort of BDSM scene that he's taking part of, uh, I think that also kind of applies to Volta because at least when I first started watching it, you know, you, he sort of comes off as sort of like a rough sort of, you know, 
dad figure to Gerion. You know, he's like gets it, getting him out of sticky situations. You know, he loses his gun. He's like, ah, oh, come on. And he gives him another one. You kind of you kind of start to like him, but you, you realize he's got some ulterior motives, and then very quickly you start to realize, oh, maybe this guy isn't on the up and up like I thought he was. He's not this just kind of gruff, grumpy sort of dad figure. He's a little bit more of a <laughs> maybe more evil than I thought he was and that image was on the surface versus what's actually going on underneath I think is also interesting with him. Yeah we should also say that you know he he blackmails uh Lotta. Yeah. Uh, the scene where he goes to Mo Mocha FD and um and and finds her there is um an important one as well because at the latest then we know that he is not on the up and up um and i, I think it's uh, i think the actor peter Kortz is, is fantastic um and again speaking of naked bodies it's interesting where you see sort of nudity in the show and where you don't um and we do see him almost fully unclothed in this scene um and his sort of uh bodily presence um in that scene i think is also very telling in the in the way that he uh really takes uh, a, a very deliberate kind of pleasure in exhibiting himself in yeah the and the body language and that's the taking up the space where it's like yeah he knows <laughs> he runs things and he's not really worried about you he feels untouchable you could tell it's like when cats roll over and they show you their belly it's like you know it means Either I trust you a lot, or I know you're not going to do anything because you can't. Because um, I'll, sh yeah. Um, so <laughs> thanks so much for everybody's really great questions. We're just going to take one last one um, from Samantha. Um, she made a really great comment. Um, As I've watched and rewatched the series, I've also noticed how different factions of characters have met in the same spaces, whether intentionally or unintentionally. I've also asked myself, or sorry, I've asked myself, how did they not realize that the other was also there? and find it to be a great moment to remind myself about the vantage point of the viewer. As viewers, we see things from the perspective of Lotta and Garion above all else, but also through smaller vantage points, for example, Yenika's, that's, that help us see the strings connecting in a greater web, or sometimes also tangling that web. And I think that this clarity, obscurity, duality is appropriate here as well. And this was re in response to the Mocha FD comment. Sort of yeah, that's, of that idea. that's a great comment. I mean, I think what you point out is also one reason why the show merits a rewatch. Re it sounds like you are rewatching it. Um, and I think that web that you mentioned and the way that it kind of manipulates different vantage points um, becomes much more clear upon second viewing um, when you are when you understand um, some of the, when you understand after the fact, some of the political alliances specifically of the characters, it makes certain kinds of interactions and certain kinds of presences and absences much more uh, visible, uh, I, I think, um, upon rewatching. And it's quite interesting in that way. I mean, the show is also really um, dense in its audiovisual language. For me, when I first watched the first season, it was hard for me to even concentrate on the plot because I was so attracted to the, the cinematic um, language and the music and, and the fashion and um, these, these kind of aspects of the surface aesthetics of the show um, that, that a lot of times I missed important things that were going on because I was not focusing in that way. Um, but it's also dense in terms of its plot development um, and the way that certain I mean, I'm seeing now um, certain foreshadowing of late, later events um, in really, really important ways. And um, since I watched it in real time, I hadn't seen the first season since it was first broadcast on Netflix um, back in 2018. Uh, and then I watched the third season when it came out this February. Um, and there were things that I, I couldn't really understand about season three because I hadn't noticed them or had forgotten about them from season one. So um, it really, it really is worthwhile um, if you like the show, if you're interested in this aesthetics to, um, to, to go back and rewatch in that way. And, and I, I think you make a great point about this kind of the way the clarity, obscurity, duality um, pertains in this regard as well, pertains to the way that um, the viewer is positioned um, and has access or doesn't to certain kinds of knowledge. And, and that kind of speaks to what the person um, asked about Bruno Voltaire's character as well in the last question.
Yeah, and just I just wanted to point out that I thought that the word specifically duality was so good, especially in terms of this show, because you have pretty much every character occupies at least one type of duality. You know, Galleon, you know, he's uh, at once he's uh, struggling with a drug addiction, but he's the law and Lotta, she's at once trying to make sure that her sister, her younger sister, um, grows up to become an educated person who can get more opportunities than she's had. And at the same time, um, you know, she is resorting to something that a lot of people in the society look down on, which is sex work. And then, you know, and, and, and then it could be said for every character, you know, Svetlana um, and for, um, sorry, uh, for Bruno Volta and, and, and the city itself. And I think that that is a good theme, especially that just runs through the whole story, the whole story. Um, this idea of duality, that, or that things are not as they seem, or the image on top versus what's going on underneath. Definitely. Yeah, and and I mean, I I mentioned that you know the the double or the figure of the double, yeah. which is a very important figure in the Weimar period and for Weimar culture and Weimar cinema. Um, also, you know, it was very operative in in battle in Berlin. Um, and and we we didn't talk about it so much this time, but the double lives, like you're saying, or the duality in the lives of individuals. Um, also, the character of Greta Overbeck, who becomes very, very important in the show as it develops, is introduced in the episodes that we looked at tonight. Um, and we didn't really talk about her character so much, but um, she's interesting as a kind of double for Lata also. They were childhood friends who encountered one another um, on some kind of a like program to like a kind of fresh air program to send um, kids to the countryside for vacation um, from kids from um, working class backgrounds got sent to the countryside for vacation and they they, they met at some kind of children's camp uh, Lotta and Greta and then um, they encounter one another um, during one of these episodes uh, episode four I think in Berlin, where Greta has come to try to work as a maid, but has um, has failed to find employment in part because she's um, kind of fr from a, a regional area, not from Berlin, um, and doesn't understand the kind of accommodations that are expected of her um, in order to work um, as a maid or in household um, in the city. Uh, and I think that the the way that sort of certain traits of uh, women's lives are mapped onto those two characters across the three seasons of the show um, is quite interesting um, to follow. And so there's a certain kind of doubling effect with, with those two characters as well. Yeah. And I think we'll definitely continue in talking about Kreta because she continues to have an important role in this show. By all means. She becomes so, a central character in the next two episodes. So we'll come back to her for sure yeah. next so that is about, um, I think we could probably continue to talk about lots of topics, but in the interest of time, we're going to go ahead and um, say thank you so much to Dr. Bear again for, um, for presenting um, on this, the next two episodes. Um, and thank you so much to everybody who tuned in. Uh, we appreciate so much that you all are supporting our virtual program in this time. Um, and we are really, really happy to see um, the really nice feedback that you all have given us um, on this particular line of programming. Uh, and as you may have noted, or as you may have seen, uh, we are gonna continue with season one. Um, so next week uh, on the 21st at 6.30, we will have another session on episodes five and six. And then on the 28th, we will have our last session on episodes seven and eight. So uh, we really hope that you all continue to tune in, continue to ask so many great questions. And uh, yeah, we really appreciate it. And we hope that we, I'm speaking as Guta Washington. <laughs> I'm not speaking as a royal we. Um, uh, yeah, we really appreciate uh, your support of Guta um, throughout this region, all of our Guta institutes. And uh, yeah, we look forward to continuing programming. Um, and yeah, that's all I've got. Esther, do you want to say anything? Thank you everyone for being here. I really appreciate it. And all this super great comments and questions. That was really generative, really thoughtful, insightful discussion. And um, it was also a lot of fun. So thanks for being here. Bye. Bye-bye. Stay safe, stay healthy. Good night.